There is a lot of space junk. And, and by a lot, I mean way more than you might think. All right. Tracked and known objects in orbit around the Earth. There's around uh, 22,000 tracked and known objects around the Earth. Of those, of those, only about 2,000 of them are fully operational functioning satellites. So 90% of the stuff that we see and track and actively monitor in space. By the way, this monitoring is done by the U.S. Space Force. I guess they're good for something other than like laughing about their name, but that's that's a different episode. 10%, 10% of the objects we track and monitor in orbit around the Earth are actually useful. The rest is junk. And then there's more than what we can track. So we suspect, we, we track and monitor 22,000 objects. Check this out. We suspect that there are around 30 to 40,000 objects larger than 10 centimeters in orbit around the Earth right now. There's another million objects larger than a centimeter orbiting the Earth. And then there's another 100 million objects smaller than that all orbiting the Earth. And this space junk comes from just just how normal everyday junk happens. Like you just do stuff in your normal everyday life. And then junk just manifests. You end up with trash. And if you're good at cleaning your house, the trash ends up in the trash can. But if you're not good at cleaning your house, the junk just ends up everywhere. And it's just the same in orbit. There's just pieces of stuff. So like we send uh, satellites up and then the satellites are in the, at the end of their mission. They run out of fuel and they're just sitting there orbiting the earth. Or we use a rocket to put a uh, satellite up and then the rocket is done and we didn't send it back to earth. And now that rocket booster is just orbiting around the earth, minding its own business. There's countless pieces of smaller things. There are paint flecks. There are broken bits of circuit board. There are uh, bits of frozen propellant. Uh, there have been some notable events over the past uh, half century uh, history of spaceflight to lead to even more space junk. One of the earliest incidents was even before we had communication satellites. This was in the 1960s. This is something called Project Westford. This is this is ridiculous, it, but it's so like classic. Uh, I just have to tell the story. So back in the 60s, we were doing a bunch of uh, missions or, or communications with overseas forces, right? So say you're a superpower like the US and you got to communicate with forces around the globe, but you don't have communication satellites. So either you can use undersea cables or you can use the ionosphere, the region of our atmosphere that's made of a bunch of uh, highly energized ions, uh, plasma particles, and you can bounce radio signals off of it, but the ionosphere goes in and out. It's not reliable. So Project Westford was an attempt to create an artificial ionosphere by launching, I'm not joking, 480 million copper needles into space. They had a failed launch and then they had a successful launch and the copper needles were starting to get everywhere. And then everyone realized how mind-blowingly stupid this was and they gave it up. And then also we invented communication satellites. So the whole thing was pointless. There was another incident uh, recently. There was... Um, uh, two satellites collided. You had the Russian Cosmos communication satellite. It was a military communication satellite that was dead. It was derelict. It was defunct. It was just hanging out in orbit. And then you had a fully functional Iridium satellite. And we saw them coming and we calculated like, okay, there's, there's a chance that they're going to collide. The communication was sent. The notification was sent to the Iridium company. They get like 400 of those notifications every single week. They calculated the pr probability of these things actually colliding. They calculated the difficulty and expense of moving their satellite out of the way. Given the low chances, they decided to just stay the course. You know what happens next. They collided. That event itself generated somewhere around 4,000 pieces of tracked and monitored space junk. Over the next like three years, only 500 of those objects fell into the atmosphere and burned up. 
you have incidents like uh, anti-satellite weapons tests. So the U.S. and the Soviets were big on this back in the 60s and 70s, and then they satisfied themselves that they could take out a satellite if they wanted to. So they stopped. But then recently, the Chinese have started doing it, and they did it. They they launched like a rock at one of their own satellites to see if they could smash it. They did. Congratulations. In the process, they generated thousands of pieces of space junk. So we have crashed satellites. We have leftover satellites. We have defunct and derelict satellites. We have bits of debris. We have just junk. Like when something goes into orbit and then something falls off. Like there, oh oh my gosh, there are, there are, pieces from of from sending astronauts into space and then they have leftover stuff they accidentally lose stuff there's like a screwdriver there's a blanket there's a toothbrush in orbit around the earth i don't know how the toothbrush got out into space i don't even want to ask because i don't want to have that knowledge in my brain but it happened we got space junk everywhere and space junk is ruining space Just like polluting a river is ruining the river, polluting the air is ruining the air, polluting space is ruining space. Yes, there's a lot of space in space. That's why we call it space, because there's a lot of it. But orbits around the Earth are pretty precious. You have two general kinds of orbits. You have low Earth orbit, which is anything less than like 1,200 um, miles altitude. And then you have geosynchronous orbit, which is way further out. And that's what keeps when uh, you want to keep a satellite over the same position on the Earth over time. So low Earth orbit is relatively compact. That's actually not a lot of space. And there's certain kinds of orbits that satellites like to have, like polar orbits or certain tracking orbits. And so, yeah, it's actually pretty crowded. It's more crowded than you might think. And then geosynchronous orbit, even though it's like way further out, the orbits there are even more limited because there's only so many ways you can be in one spot above the Earth. And so the space junk problem is there too. And what 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 the problem is, is that these pieces of space junk, from the little tiny paint flecks to the entire satellites, are traveling at tens of thousands of miles per hour. And when no matter how big you are, even if you're just a little tiny paint fleck, if you're traveling at tens of thousands of miles per hour, you are bad news. All right, the space shuttles were famous or infamous for collecting pieces of space junk. A paint fleck hit one of the windows, dug a a crater a millimeter across, which doesn't sound big, but like if that hit you, that would hurt. A broken piece of circuit board went clean through a radiator on space shuttle Atlantis. The, there's constantly stuff getting embedded in the thermal tiles, and we all all know how that ended. Space junk is a problem. About once a year, the International Space Station has to pr- do uh, maneuvers in order to avoid a piece of space junk that has like more than a 1.1% chance of hitting it. So on average, once a year, the astronauts have to hunker down in a Soyuz capsule while the International Space Station makes some emergency maneuvers. These things are fast, they are nasty, and it can lead to something, a cascade, where imagine if you have two satellites colliding and they generate a bunch of debris. And then the debris is circling the Earth at tens of thousands of miles per hour, and they hit another satellite and decommission, and then they crash, and they make more debris, and then that debris shuts down more satellites, and then you end up populating the entire orbit of the Earth with junk, and it's impossible to clean it up because if you try to send a satellite up to to take care of everything, it just gets hit by, hit by space junk and becomes part of the problem. This is something called Kessler syndrome. It's a real possibility. Are we near Kessler syndrome right now? Not necessarily. But are we going to get there? Yeah. We are going to reach the point where Kessler syndrome is a real problem. And that's because right now we have 
around 2,000 active functioning satellites in orbit. Over the next decade, we're planning on launching tens of thousands of satellites with these broadband global internet satellites, things like SpaceX's Starlink project. There's OneWeb, there's Project Kuiper, uh, there's like a Chinese version, there's probably five others that I don't even know about. Each one of these programs is launching planning to launch thousands, if not tens of thousands of satellites to provide global internet access. That's a lot of satellites. That's a lot of possibilities for problems. That is not fun. Yes, these satellites are supposed to have artificial intelligent, you know, you know, a collision avoidance systems. Yes, it's supposed to, uh, they're supposed to deorbit at the end of their lifetimes and just burn up in the atmosphere. But like, there's no guarantees that any of that will work right now. Our collision avoidance systems consists of emails and alerts from the space force and say, Hey, company a organization B, your satellites are going to collide, uh, figure it out. And then they coordinate like, Oh, so, Oh, do you want to move your satellite? satellite or, or should we or like uh you know if we move it's going to be a little bit costly can you like it's all this this informal system of shooting emails back and forth that is what is protecting our sky right now is casual email oh hey sarah so uh heard your satellite's gonna run into ours um Wondering if you'd be willing to move it because we moved last time and I think it's 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 your it's just your what do you think? Get back to me. This is how we're protecting our skies. So it's just going to get worse. Now, there are plans. There are um, ideas out there to both mitigate the amount of space junk and to try to eliminate the current space junk. So to mitigate one is, hey. National laws that say if you're going to launch, you need a deorbit plan. When your satellite's done, it's either ditching itself in the atmosphere and burning up, or it's going parked on a way, way far away orbit called the graveyard orbit, way far away from the Earth where nobody cares. If you're using a rocket to send it up, which of course you are, uh, that rocket's getting ditched in the Pacific. You got to have a plan for that. You got to use up all fuel, all propell propellant, all volatiles to make sure this thing doesn't like accidentally blow up. There's like one satellite. There's like the SNAP satellite. This is a nuclear powered satellite that was launched in the 60s or 70s. Uh, it's going to be in its orbit for 4,000 years because there wasn't a plan back then to deorbit these things and get rid of them. Did I mention that 100 tons of space junk falls from the sky every single day? Yeah, that's a thing. A hundred tons, or sorry, a year. A hundred tons of space junk falls from the sky every single year. One hundred tons. One person, Lottie Williams of Tulsa, Oklahoma, has been hit by a piece of space junk. It was a six-inch piece of aluminum. Hit her on the shoulder. Like, come on. It's and, and, and so there's mitigation strategies, which, like, let's hope it works. Uh, and then there are some ideas to try to get rid of some of the junk satellites. The small stuff you really can't do anything about. You just hope it eventually burns up in the atmosphere over the course of decades and that we don't add to the problem. There are plans to uh, launch a satellite and then hook up with a defunct satellite and then drag it down into orbit, into the atmosphere, or push it up into the graveyard orbit. They used... These plans call for very advanced technologies such as harpoons and nets, because apparently when mission designers are trying to come up with creative ideas for getting rid of dead satellites, they drew their inspiration from 19th century whaling expeditions. There's this device, this idea called a laser broom. I'm not making this up either, where you have a giant laser on the ground and you shoot it at a satellite and you like try to heat up or ablate one side of it more than the other. And this shifts the orbit and eventually, hopefully it goes into the atmosphere and burns up. The problem with all of these proposals and why there hasn't been a lot of movement on this, there's a lot of ideas, but not a lot of tests, is one, it's expensive. The cost of deorbiting a satellite is essentially the cost of launching a satellite, and launching a satellite is super expensive and hard. 
Two, these technologies like are in their infancy. And three, if you have a deorbit technology, if you're like, aha, we have a harpoon system where we can latch onto another satellite and drag it down into the atmosphere, you also have a satellite destruction mechanism, like an enemy anti-satellite technology. And so, of course, the militaries around the world are interested in this, and maybe they've already developed it, but they're not telling anyone. Because, yeah, if you had a way to get rid of an enemy satellite and you didn't cause space junk and contribute to a potential Kessler syndrome event, that'd be pretty handy. So probably the technology already exists, but we don't get to use it to actually clean up space junk. There's one other issue here, which is light pollution. Uh, this this is just like personally upsetting to me. Like, yes, yeah, space junk in orbit is a problem for satellites, but I don't launch satellites. I don't run a satellite company. So it's like not personally affecting me, but space junk does personally affect me and you because every little bit of space junk out there reflects a little bit of sunlight. From the tiniest paint plaque to every single solar panel on every single satellite. The amount of light pollution has grown by 10%. So our skies are 10% brighter than they were 50 years ago. On average, no matter where you go in the world, because of all the space junk, because of all the satellites. So you can be in the deepest, darkest sky preserve on the planet, and your sky is 10% brighter than it was 50 years ago. And it's going to get worse because of all those mega constellations. All those tens of thousands of communication satellites. And, and when we can talk about the benefits of high-speed broadband internet access around the world, of course, that's a benefit. But is it a net benefit? Like, it's making our skies brighter. It is making astronomy harder. Yes, uh, Starlink, uh, SpaceX, they have plans. They said they're going to make their satellites like darker, so it's not as bad, but it's still pretty bad. And no one's holding them accountable. There's no law, there's no rule, there's no regulation that says they have to stop. So I just encourage you uh, to keep thinking about this. Keep thinking about the problem of space junk. Keep thinking about the proliferation of satellites. And, and let's have a conversation about the pros and cons. About, yes, broadband internet access around the world is great. Uh, losing our night skies is pretty bad. So let's talk. It shouldn't be up to one person or one company to make that decision for all of humanity to take away our night skies. And it's a real thing and it's going to get worse. So like, let's talk. Let's talk before it's too late. Thank you so much for watching. Please contribute to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep this show going. Like, share, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. And watch out for falling space junk.